Hi, Samba. Hi, Falaki. Hi. It's so good to see you. Oh, nice to see How you. How are you? Nice to see you, to see you too. Wonder. One of the lessons in the pandemic for us at the foundation has been understanding what's happening on the ground and being close to our partners. We're really privileged today to have two guests who are really knowledgeable, not only about the virus, but also the situation on the ground in Africa. And it's my hope that through this informal dinner, we're going to get more insight into what has been going on in those parts of the world where we really haven't had insight so far. The places that are likely to have variants or spikes in cases are also the same places where the systems to deal with them are also very weak. This starts with communities. It doesn't start in front of a computer sitting here in Seattle or sitting in Geneva. You have to be inside the community. And look what I've brought us for lunch today. It's a South African dish that is called babuti. The babuti is minced meat and then has chutney in it. So that sounds sweet. amazing. Looks yeah. good. It looks amazing. For Loki and Samba, it is our great pleasure to welcome you to Seattle. Mm -hmm. And uh, today we're going to talk about the COVID pandemic, but in particular, we're interested in discussing how the variants have changed the nature of the epidemic. When all this started, we were hoping for vaccines, and we talked a lot about flattening the curve of this pandemic to save lives. And ironically, as the first vaccines quite miraculously, you could argue, rolled off the shelf, a variant was discovered, and flattening the curve turned into trying to ride the waves because we've had mm -hmm. one wave after another. And I guess the, the opening question is, what were your thoughts about the emergence of these variants and how they might impact your lives as you, uh, as you experienced the pandemic? This was really a, a critical moment for, for all of us. The moment where the variants were discovered really put a shock wave into everyone in terms of the transmissibility and also the severity. I remember just being so depressed sort of right after coming back into the new year in 2021, because it, just, it was just clear then that there would be these repeated waves of infections. So that concept of herd immunity and flattening the curve and all of that no longer applied and all of a sudden we are going back to start a whole new big tornado again. So I was really extremely worried and trying to think what's gonna happen next. There was a lot of optimism that if we had a vaccine that could protect us, that we could minimize the size of the pandemic. And then suddenly these variants came almost out of left field. It was a race against the variants, I would say. Um, of which I think we, we were far behind. So you may be aware that in fact, Bill Gates has written a book based on the experiences that he's had and the advice that he's also had from many of us at the foundation. And one of the opening chapters, he talks about the fact that we accept that virtually everywhere around the world, there are fire stations, there are fire brigades, there are people paid simply to be there for when the emergency occurs. Mm. We don't have this for infectious diseases in many parts of the world. And mm -hmm. What do you think of that analogy? And, and do you think there's some way going forward that we could be bre better prepared? If you have a, an alarm system to tell you that smoke is coming out somewhere, you have to, for me, in places like Africa, number one, you have to make sure, do I have it? Number two, if yes, is it working? Right. Number three, if you have extinguisher, small ones everywhere in different villages, are they working? Practicing is also important, right? Absolutely. Because like firefighters, all of them, they practice. Those firefighters is what I used to call during my Ebola days, mm -hmm. the health army. You have to have your health SWAT team. Before Ebola, there was nothing like that. So during Ebola, we tried to set this up in some countries like my own. We were so lucky and fortunate to set a system like this up. And then you see 
how well we've been doing with Ebola. And now with this pandemic, nothing happened. It's like we forget about forget everything. everything. So we should make sure that this is not going to happen again. It's not good enough for those systems to be in some places. Mm -hmm. They've got to be in all the places mm -hmm. because what this pandemic has really shown us is that we're all at risk. Yeah. This is an investment that will mm -hmm. be very important in preventing the next pandemic or ensuring that uh, we do not have the catastrophic loss of lives and the devastation mm -hmm. on the economies that we have seen from the COVID pandemic. We've talked a lot about, uh, in the pandemic, about being able to detect something faster. But if you can detect something faster, but you can't do anything about it, uh, that detection doesn't matter, right? You can have smoke and you can have a fire, but if you don't have the fire extinguisher, if you don't have the fire brigade, if you don't have the fire station, it's not going to work. It's not going to make a difference. So in the same way, a health system has to be prepared to be able to respond. I believe that Africa has largely had to weather this pandemic on its own. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the life-saving vaccines that we started talking about did not materialize in time. And so today, the vast proportion of people in Africa have actually been exposed to the virus and, yeah. and many have died. We, we don't know how many, but we have to do better. And so what are your thoughts about how we could do better, how we can get vaccines out quicker? How can we better arm uh, people in poor countries so that they can be protected earlier? The level of uh, vaccination is unacceptably low. And this largely at the onset was due to the lack of vaccine supply, mm -hmm. adequate numbers. Mm -hmm. and arriving in the region. Mm -hmm. This has largely changed. Uh, the vaccine supplies are increasing. We also realize that the vaccines and then there's the delivery systems. In Africa, there are places like my own country, less than 3% of the population is, have received even uh, a complete vaccination. But clearly, very few, even so far, have not received a single dose of, 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 of a given vaccine. A vaccine on a shelf in a system where there's ability to deliver quickly is very different from a context where those systems do not exist. Governments are not always ready uh, to, to support, to help. And healthcare workers already overwhelmed, and then this pandemic is coming and it's difficult to manage. Are there any things that you guys would like to share with us? Anything top of mind about this pandemic and how you've experienced it on the ground? What I'm seeing is that most of the time um, there is a lack of great communication. There is no direct uh, enough communication with communities. During the pandemic, some of the investigators went to see some village leaders. They wanted to set up some studies on COVID. About COVID. So the, the, the chief said to them, we don't want to see you here anymore because you only come here when, when there are big problems. During Ebola, you came, and since after that, you never came back here. Mm -hmm. So it's like you wait till we get close to, to dying, and then you come. It means you can only prepare a better war during peacetime. Peacetime is where really you have to try to stay in touch with people, try to build. Uh, from the existing platform. So I'm trying to say here, community first. That's the first level. This starts with communities. It doesn't start in front of a computer sitting here in Seattle or sitting in Geneva. You have to be inside the community. You have to be where the problems are. I would even add to that that there are already increases in terms of um, yeah other vaccine-preventable diseases, particularly yeah. in Africa. Uh, yeah. Measles being a highly infectious disease, you can imagine the build-up of unprotected yeah. Yeah. Um, 
population, yeah. uh, this, this is actually a huge risk. It is, yeah. So you think even essential services have been affected in a very bad way? Completely, completely, completely yeah. very bad way. Well, this is a tragedy and, and, and of course threatens again the whole world. This is a global problem and so the solutions are, are, are global and hopefully some of the lessons learned will, uh, will change the world for, uh, for better. If we don't do well for next time, the tragedy, the consequences are going to be even worse inside our communities. People are starting now not to trust us anymore. If I think about what was the biggest impact of the variants, is losing public confidence, because then people thought, like, these guys don't know what they're talking about, you know? I mean, they told us one thing, but now they're telling us something totally different. One of the great inequities was that Africa, having discovered both the Beta and the Omicron variant, was then punished uh, with travel bans. And can you talk a little bit about your feelings about travel bans? I'm not a travel ban fan. I have to tell you the truth. And why? <sighs> no one is safe until everybody is safe. This pathogen, they don't need passports or visas or fingerprints to f travel. One example is Mali. When the president called me and Samba, should we close our border? Because this country did, this one did, this one did, what do you think? I said, Mr. President, there is no border. When there are crises like this, we need to unite, to work together. South Africa did a fantastic job by helping the entire world, by saving lives everywhere. But look, the consequences were very bad on them. I think the experience has showed us that border closures don't work. I mean, it's uh, unless you're an island country. This food is really delicious. It's Keith, really this, nice. was, this was just amazing. I, I cleaned my plate. Oh, I noticed. <laughs> and, I noticed. Uh, and maybe I can have some leftovers to go home. Oh, uh, with pleasure. <laughs> you have to pass me the recipe. Compliments okay. to the chef. <laughs> the recipe came from my late mother, and I'm sure she would be delighted mm. to hear that people are still enjoying it's a it. It's Wonderful. As we think about moving forward, what are some key lessons we should follow? Um, what are some good things that came out of the pandemic? Are there, are there any good things that came out? Are there any silver linings? With any crisis, we have to be focused on what are the opportunities mm -hmm. uh, there. The investments in the um, vaccine technology at an unprecedented rate and speed. Some diseases that we've been waiting for a vaccine for long time, HIV and AIDS, can benefit from the type of systems, processes, and investments that were put in place for, for, for COVID. And I really like what Sambo said, that we don't have to wait for there mm -hmm. to be a crisis to have the dialogue and engagement with communities. It's about establishing relationships and We've learned how to do that within this particular crisis. Vaccine manufacturing in, in Africa, and we can do this step by step because you don't want to transfer this technology so fast and let it die there mm. with no impact almost. It's not only about making it, it's also about making sure it's being used, you know, making sure that the quality is there, making sure that the market is there functioning. We have to make sure primary healthcare system is working. We have to make sure community is heavily involved. It's not a matter of bringing vaccine in a country. It's a matter of making sure those vaccines are going into muscles. Right. And I really like the way that the, both of you uh, describe this in terms of we need to make sure that the basic health infrastructure, primary health care, mm -hmm. is serving the needs of people. It's preventing measles, mm -hmm. it's preventing mm -hmm. tetanus. Mm -hmm. And we can have a vision for vaccine manufacturing that uh, will take some time to realize, but it's an important goal to have for the long term. If the first set of variants took us by surprise in terms of their speed and transmissibility, uh, the, the next set certainly should not. So, Falaki, in closing, yeah. how well are we prepared now at the end of this two years of the pandemic to detect the next one? On a scale of one to 10, what do you think? I think we are, we are better prepared, but we need to do more. 
So I would say maybe we're at a six. Oh, well, that's hopeful. Keith, in some things for vaccine possibilities and innovation, I, I think we are six or seven. I think we have yeah. made a lot of progress on how to make vaccines faster on the health systems preparedness, on the detection side, on the health communication side, I would give us a two. And I think that there is just a lot more to do. Yeah, we can reach the 10 very fast if we do not repeat the same mistakes. Thank both of you so much mm -hmm. for sharing your thoughts and having this meal with us. And mm -hmm. we really appreciate you joining us in Seattle today. Thank you, merci beaucoup. Thank you, it's Thank been you. lovely. For sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Such a great meal. Thank you.